Moving on through the record, Simon. So, uh, "Made for Pleasure" uh, was the next one, and um, that one. Um, Twenty fifteen, I think that was. Um, let's do another. It was pretty cool. Oh yeah, which is a kind of um, sort of jazz, funky, um, soundtracky type. It's sort of a bit, a bit Quincy Jones. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of. Like a, a sort of spy thriller from the seventies, yeah. that kind of sound, isn't it? And um, that was inspired by our horn section. Um, Mike Olmos is a trumpet player from the Bay Area, and Joe Cohen, uh, and they came in. And I think that was what was different about that is that I believe that we had the horns in the same room at the same time when we were jamming and writing. Whereas usually if we've ever had horns, they've come in afterwards and they've overdubbed and they've come up with lines on top of what we've already recorded. Whereas I think this was maybe the only album where we included them in the jamming and writing process, which is what, which is probably where Let's Do Another comes from, because that's, that is quite led by the horns. Uh, that was recorded in New Orleans. Um, and I do remember the, when we first showed up, that we had nothing so it was the one of the quickest albums in, in terms of setup in terms of getting everything ready and getting a drum sound sometimes that that used to take days for the for breaks for the border it took days to get the drum sound and the drum sound wasn't even particularly good at the end of it this one within a couple of hours everything was ready they had vintage drums in there i just had to pick some a combination of things set set them up there was a grand piano, a Fender Rhodes, a, a Wurlitzer, Hammond B3. All that gear was there in the room and lovely vintage amps. Within two hours, the engineer said, OK, right, we're ready to go. And we looked at each other and said, has anyone got any tunes? And nobody did. <laughs> and uh, it was just a sinking feeling of, shit, we're here for a week and we've got to make an album what are we going to do and we we jammed a bit anyway the first day was kind of a bit of a um just a bit of a washout like we left that with not really having achieved anything and i remember going back to the, the apartment that we were staying at and i just out of desperation i started writing lyrics and um there's a song on there that is sung by charlie lowry um Called. Can you see the track list there? Yeah. Just gotta run. Just gotta run. I think it is. It's a sort of northern yeah. soul type mm -hmm. sound sounding tune. Anyway, so I remember writing that o overnight after the first disastrous day where we hadn't come up with anything. But then during the course of the week, that whole album came together sort of out of nowhere. And it's one of my favourite records, and I, I really like the sound, and I love the way the horns are involved and the vocals and all that. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites, too. I like the way the cover looks, also. It's got that cool red uh, kind of... Red neon. Well, yeah. I, I remember um, photography is my side gig, and we came up with the idea with the designer for uh, just the CD neon strip club sign, and I needed to find a background for it. Um, and... Uh, I went to a rough part of Leeds with my camera in the rain and I found this closed down row of, of shops 
and I just took a load of pictures and the one that uh, is on the album cover is is this CD place with graffiti on the on the boarded up yeah, showing and they and then the the neon sign was was just done graphically and superimposed on it I think it just it's one of those ones that just sets the kind of mood for the music too and it's just very cohesive that way and um, other tracks I got to mention high and wide I like that one a lot yeah that's a, a, a nice um, if ever we have horns on a live show we tend to start the set with that tune because it just comes straight in bow with a just like a real a, a punch a horn punch stab thing and then the, it's a high energy groove um, so that's still that's still one that we know how to play and also uh, faux baby yeah so uh pho, as in pho the vietnamese um broth we we found a, a place near the studio and we had lunch there nearly every day and um joe our keyboard player came back with feeling really bloated and kind of lifted up his shirt and he said i've got a pho, a faux a baby <laughs> um, and and he, I think he came up with the, the that tune. So whenever anyone comes up with a tune, they generally have to supply a title for it. So that's where that came from. Came really, from uh, I like the way it builds. I want to build nicely. Yeah, and that um, the groove on that, I think I I was quite influenced by the Purdy thing because it's a it, it's a bit of a shuffly. I remember I'd definitely been working on that in the run up to recording that album and I thought oh I'm going to try and get one of those in <laughs> to uh, to this record see if it gets allowed and it was you did another live one now distinguished for myself and the listeners viewers you have uh, Master Sounds live records and you also have some session records so obviously the, the session ones are, are more intimate maybe it's just you guys playing I mean, you play live anyway when you make your studio records. So. No, yes, you, you wouldn't think you would need to make the distinction. Um, so there are two session records. They, they were recorded in Nashville. There's the Nashville session, and then there's the Nashville session two. And um, the idea of those two is there was a small audience, in, in, but it is in a recording studio. So it's, a, it's an analog studio recording on directly onto tape, the mixing took place during the day as in getting levels and so when we committed it to tape it was just a stereo recording um so there's no uh, master there's no multi-track situation at that point um and what we wanted was to play as if we were doing a live set but we wanted the sound of the studio the tape recording so that it sounded like a that like the sound that we like from the music we listen to the, the, that sort of 60s 70s sound um but we wanted the energy and the arrangements of what we do when we're playing our tunes that we're really familiar with that we've been playing for years and that we've developed arrangements for over the years we wanted that to be captured because all of all of the songs on there they were recorded just after we wrote them in the studio in the 15 years leading up to it and that was that they're almost just a springboard of the idea of what the song then became when after we played it for 10 years so we thought let's get a record of this we can do it in one evening and that's in some ways my favorite record because it is what the band should sound like and uh it's it's what the the audience taper recordings if I had my way, they'd all sound like that, but they can't because it's just a, a digital recorder at the back of a room with, with two mics and it's not crunched onto tape like it is in the studio. So the Nashville session is the best of all possible worlds. It's We're really familiar with the material. We're in the middle of a tour, so we're very familiar with each other. We're at the top, we're on our A game in terms of communication with each other. There's a bit of atmosphere because there's maybe 15 people in the room, so we've got someone to play to, and the sound is exactly what we want. So that, I hope, explains those two records. Absolutely. And the reason there's two is that the first one has Hammond organ 
as the only keyboard sound. And then the second one has no Hammond and it's all pianos and synthesizers. So it's different material. Can I hold, hold for like two minutes, Simon? Sure. I'll be right back. No problem. Okay. Hey, hey, can I go to the bathroom at this point? Yes. Hey, sorry about Hi. that. Oh, that's weird. I didn't see which door you left. I was thinking you were going to come from that the door that I can see in the shop, but I guess that's a closet, is it? It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let me start recording again here. Actually, I had gone, um, I was trying to find, you know, I have uh, most of your stuff on digital, but... I have the first CD somewhere that I got, 
And I was trying to find that because I don't remember which one was the first one I had gotten. And I couldn't, I ran downstairs. I couldn't find it. So anyway. Have you seen us live? No. Only heard it live. Not seen. So. It looks like we're, we're still recording. Okay. Yep, we're good. Okay. Um, edit that out. So we were just finishing up talking about the session records and how that's like the best of all worlds, it uh, sounds like. And, um, you know, on that, I think it's the first one, yeah, the Vandenberg Suite is really a nice track. That's such a fun track to play live still um and that was so van dave vandenberg is the is the guy who's based in chicago he's the one that was responsible for getting us over to the us in 2004. he uh he's the one that emailed three weeks after we set up a website and invited us and he he's got us the opening slot put us up in his house drove us around kind of gave us a career in the states um, and we wrote that tune in his basement in 2004 in Chicago and we're still playing it. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, so the, the only, the only bad thing about the session records is that they don't generate any new material. And, and as I mentioned before, the, at least half the purpose of us making an album is to give us some new tunes to play in the live set. Um, so the, the the session records are all existing tunes that have already had some kind of life, um, and uh, but I, they're great. They're great recordings. I'm really glad, glad we did them, and we managed to to do them whilst on tour, while we happened to be in Nashville, and then happened to have a day off the next day after doing the Nashville show. So there was no extra expense involved in getting everybody together. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind we all live in different countries, so making a record now involves the cost of at least moving some of us to where some others of us are to make it, you know. How, how long has, has your bandmate lived in Colorado? Uh, well, he, he, he's, he, he's lived in the States for probably seven years now, but he started in San Francisco, moved to New Orleans, and then he's been in Denver probably for maybe four years. I would think um and our bass player has been in menorca for at least 10 years mm. so the yeah re rehearsal isn't really anything maybe we get to rehearse no we don't we no, we don't really get to rehearse if we're doing an absolute special gig a one-off thing with loads of guests then occasionally we might get a few hours to to run the tunes in advance but um, a lot of people do say, well, how do you rehearse if you live in uh, all these different places? And it, the, the rehearsal was the 21 years of being together. So, <laughs> and there's a lot of improvisation anyway. So it's a, it's a question of communicating on stage rather than having a, a, a fixed plan in advance. Well, what do you feel is most different about the sound or chemistry of the band today uh, versus 10 or even 20 years at the outset? I think there's just so much more depth to the musical relationships that we have and so much of how we communicate is now instinctive and there's a shared vocabulary that has been developed that is deeper. Um, so it just might be that we we exist more like a single organism now in terms of the bass drums guitar and keyboards and how it all just how we all complement each other without really having to think about it or consciously write parts for each other it's just eddie will start playing guitar i will join in on drums and people join in on bass and 
it'll sort of immediately be right in a way that you just don't get with four musicians who all might be quite good but haven't met before. Mm -hmm. Renewable energy was the one that came out just a couple of years ago now. And um, I like that cover too. It's pretty. Yeah, the sort of cool cover. Cartoon instruments cover. Yeah. yeah. Um, to me, it seemed um, just a little jazzier, you know? Um, yeah. Is it um, all, almost completely instrumental, I think? Um, and, there's, and there's horns on it. Yeah, there's horns. Quite a lot of horns. I think, yeah, where the. Um, When Mike almost the trumpet player is uh, involved, that gives it a jazzier feel because he's he's from a jazz background and he had a lot of input into renewable energy. So that's that explains that slight shift in the sound. But we do waver, do like from funkier to jazzier to smoother to rougher. We we kind of navigate a way through over the years with that kind of slight change in, in sound. Uh, well, speaking of jazz, living that jazz life is a highlight for me. And that I think is a trumpet feature. Um, so probably uh, if, I'm th if I'm thinking about the right track, it's a kind of JB's style uh, vamp with trumpet over the top of it. Does that, does that ring a bell? Yeah. Because I haven't listened to it probably since we, since we recorded it. Um, but that's a bit like the way you were talking about Joseph's, that track, which is which is Joe playing keyboards over the top of that vamp. I think living that jazz life is a similar thing. It's just a groove that we believe in and st stick to. And it's, yeah, heavily JB's influenced, but with a jazzier rather than a funky feel to the top end. And then the Funk 49, that's the Joe is Walsh it, song, right? The James Gang is the, yeah, the Joe Walsh is, yeah. So that uh, our, our guitarist wife, um, she, it's one of her favorite songs. None of us had heard it because it didn't make it really, it, 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 it's not well known in Britain, but hmm. when she said, you should do this tune. And whenever we have played it live, the audiences obviously recognize it and it's clear they re react to it immediately and we're like oh wow okay yeah this is really a well-known tune and for us it was just we'd never heard of it and and uh we responded to it um and again without listening to it too carefully so our version does something slightly different i think melodically because we haven't really listened to it properly <laughs> That's okay. I, you know, to me, there's no point in doing a cover unless you really bring something fresh to it. Yeah. You know. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said these to you as well. <laughs> but I mean, I that, that song, though, in the States, you probably know by now, but I mean, it's been an album oriented rock staple ever since, you know, the 1970s. Yeah. 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 And we still, we do still sometimes do it, but. Um, Eddie's Eddie sounds good on the record, I think, but w when he does it live, he's he's a, sometimes a bit too raspy and struggles to to reach the notes. And now we've got Lamar with us. Uh, it, it's it just feels wrong for Eddie to sing a lead vocal when we've got an actual singer. <laughs> yeah, so for Shake It, as we touched on earlier, but that's the latest and uh, great. Uh, well, not. Greatest is uh, subjective, but it's, um, uh, it's funkier than the previous one, and it's got the vocals, like you mentioned. So definitely, um, uh, it almost seemed to me like you guys are trying to be different to an extent from one studio record to the next. You know, still staying within, you know, this certain vernacular, but not, you know, being a carbon copy, you know. Well, absolutely, because because the point of it is that we don't get bored, and so we we got we got to the point where we were about to record "Shake It," and we <clears> just <throat> said we can't do another instrumental album. Like we just what do, what do we have to say? And we didn't have anything to say. But so it, 
it, it was it was essential that we did something different then because um we we needed it to be fresh for us um and uh it remains to be seen what that will be for the next one but um but shake it certainly shook us all up and gave us a whole new reason to believe in it again and uh and those songs are so much fun to play live and we we have in fact i think yes okay that's the probably the only album where we have performed the entire album live from start to finish in album order there's no tracks there that are just album just for the studio we, we've done all of them live and they've all worked as well mm. so um but where, to do that we have to have um the horns uh so on this one who did we have jason mingledorf is a, is a uh, tenor sax player and flute player from new orleans and mike almost our, our um, long-term collaborator on trumpet um and we need percussion as well for a couple of the tracks and we we had a guy there's a there's a band called thievery corporation out of dc um mm -hmm. and he is the kit player for that band but he's a really great percussionist as well and um he uh, played on the record and we've had him on a couple of live shows and it's great when that happens now and that, that, that when we have that we can do the whole thing and um uh, we did that for the album launch in the in london and i think we maybe did it in denver too but yeah that's um yeah there's every other album has at least two tracks that we have never performed live that we just did them in the studio eddie produced them into something that worked and then we never looked at them again um but yeah this album is different i really like um let's go back oh yeah this uh, that's it the swampy inspired by um lee dorsey alan toussaint type groove and songwriting approach um and uh it that uses our gang vocal when we i can't remember if we actually recorded the backing vocals on the record or if that was lamar but i know that when we do it live it just sounds just as good as the record with all four of us doing the the gang vocal chorus and it's fun to do it, and it feels real and permission to land that um that's the percussion feature um it's got tim barley's just sort of responding uh to the rest of the band in a kind of question and answer thing and that is super fun also jb's inspired absolutely in yeah. terms of the the way the groove is kind of uniform and just repeats and and doesn't mess around just kind of sticks to uniformity but with that solid belief hey, you, you asked me about seeing you guys live which reg regrettably i have not um have you guys played um the north charlotte area much we've done i think we've done uh two shows in charlotte do, do you know a venue called the visualite yeah i'm actually probably going there next week yeah so i know we've played there um probably five years ago or more um and then i also remember that we have played in charlottesville and in the early days we didn't really understand you just see them on the tour schedule charlotte and charlottesville and that's virginia got though yeah yeah, in Virginia, but it's not that far away, is it? It's a few hours, is it? Or um, five hours? It might be four hours. Yeah, um, but I remember getting a bit mixed up about. Oh, did when did we play there? Well, there's also Charleston, which people mix up too, which is just down south. So. Yes, now we've played Charleston endless times because they have a venue called the Poor House, and um, I feel like we've probably played Charleston more than 10 times um wow. not sure why because some we don't choose as such which which venues have us back over and over again it, um because some fans complain and say why don't you ever come here and i don't know what the answer is it will just be that it presumably it didn't work out very well or the 
the booking agent can't line it up on the date when we need the show and the venue's available or something. It's just down to factors, mysterious factors. Yeah. Well, if anything, um, I'm sure I'm, I'm there. Um, do, you, do you ever travel to places like New York for shows? Not just for a show, no. 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 So you're not like those people that I talked about who drove five hours to see the Grey Boy All-Stars. I'm not. Because I have I, I have something called responsibilities. Got it. You know. <laughs> Understood. So we'll have to come to you then. Um, no, I wish I could do that. I, my, my limit generally is like two hours. Right. Okay. So hang on charlotte which could be Asheville, and a lot of cool shows happen in yes Asheville. we did we did do Asheville quite recently like october <clears throat> um the, i've got some video of that online that i'll i'll send you the links because we that show was multi-camera filmed and recorded really well excellent so simon do you have a particular favorite album uh, you mentioned 10 years on was probably one of your favorites is there a definitive favorite album and or track in the repertoire? Hmm. No, I, there's no way I could choose a, a, a definitive track. But I would say if I was if I was going to um, if I wanted someone who's never heard the band, and I, I, the one that I would want to represent the band would be the Nashville Session, Volume One. It's just called the Nashville Session, but that would be. That would be the one that I'd be most proud of saying, this is the band I've been in for 20 years and this is what it should sound like and does sound like, I would say. So do you think that's the best place for a newbie to start or should they start somewhere else? No, I would. I think it is a good place for them to start. Yeah, right. and if they like the sound, then there's so much more for them to explore, like what we've just been talking about for the past hour. Mm -hmm. um, and. If they don't like the sound, then I would say it's, it's probably not going to be for them. <laughs> and they don't need to bother with any of the others. I don't know if you would agree with that, but that's how it feels to me. Yeah, well, I would say that or, you know, I'm partial 10 years on or <clears throat> or um, the um, New, or New Orleans uh, one. The Made for Pleasure. Yeah. yeah. What um, what would you say your top maybe three albums by other artists of all time? Well, because I'm a piano player as well still, um, but I don't play funk or jazz on the piano. Um, one of my, well, the, probably I would say my all time favorite album is Hunky Dory by David Bowie from 1971. And that is a real piano album. Uh, the guy playing on it is Rick Wakeman, who's mm -hmm. from the, the prog rock band Yes. And his his piano arrangements on that are just amazing. And um, I'm not a huge Bowie fan. Like I, there are there are a couple of other Bowie albums I like, but you know some people just absolutely adore everything he does. That's not me. But that album is my I don't know something about getting to know it when I was about 18. And I, I think when you're 18 and the, an album speaks to you it sort of implants itself for life doesn't it because that is the time when you're probably the most receptive to um to things like that to cultural things um so there's that album and then from the funk and soul point of view um i would say uh, jimmy mcgriff's electric funk which i would urge you to check out is there a third thing? Um, no, I'm I, I'm I'm drawing a blank just because there's too many there's too many options, and I just don't know where to pull the third album in without two's, sounding like <laughs> two, two's pretty good. Um, did you ever go back and, you know, listen to, you know, drummers though, like, you know, the Billy Cobhams and uh, Lenny Whites and these, you know, really prodigious the, drummers? See, they, they, I find um, the, the kind of the technical, flashy, fusion-y stuff doesn't really turn me on. Um, 
as as much as the JB just tasty, tasty groove that's quite simple and consistent and yeah, I, I, I don't want flashy. I, I want I want it to just be a, a, that everyone is in service to the groove and the groove it moves you. And so individual super flashy playing doesn't really speak to me. So no is the answer to that. Um, and I don't know if that's why I never learned how to do that myself or maybe because I wasn't particularly good at that, that's why I didn't like the music. I don't know which way around it came, but I would much rather hear somebody playing something really straightforward that's just exactly right with the other musicians. That's my answer. <laughs> and are, is, is the group better known and more famous uh, in America than in the UK? Or how's the fan base flesh out yeah, it's it's main. So our main audience is in the US, and I would say Bay Area, Denver, New York, New Orleans are the sort of key places where people seem to care about us. Um, we do one one uh, visit to the UK per year. We play a lead show, which is our original hometown where I am now, and we play a London show. And um, the audience has stayed pretty consistent, but there's still maybe four, 400 people. Excuse me a moment. Um, yeah, uh, it's not grown. It hasn't grown in the UK. And I guess it probably won't now because we're mainly based in the US. Um, but the, the American thing, it's been really good to us and it's kind of taught us how to play differently, to have, have I lost you? No, I'm here. I, it's just you've gone off my screen. Hang on. Uh, I still see you. There you are. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, so we we learned how to jam and how to open things out and to really respond to a crowd in, in a way that was unique to each event. We learned that in America. And it was because the fans that were coming to see us are into that improvisational thing the, the jam scene um they've come from a sort of grateful dead hippie background but they also like funk and they also like bluegrass and they also like all sorts of different stuff but they yeah. want the musicians yeah. having a conversation and so we learned how to be have these open conversations with each other but to keep it exciting and keep it dynamic and try and control the energy so that it's it's actually telling some kind of story and taking you on a journey and giving you some tension and then release. And so we, that we learned all that in, in the States prior to coming, we would just play our three and a half minute arrangements that were like the record. And it was all just about the scratchy vintage funk sound. Now it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's about that, but it's about so much more. It's about having this public conversation that everybody can come and, and, take part in because we need to see the audience when we're playing we, we make sure there's light on them because we want to see their faces and we want to see them react to us and react to each other and we want to see each other as well so at, we don't like the kind of shows where the audience is in complete darkness and and it's all just trippy lights on stage because we can't see, we need to see each other's fingers we need to see each other's faces um and then we can have a real conversation is there one specific unforgettable show or memory from touring that just stands out that you could share? Um, I, I I do remember that when we played at Fuji Rock Festival in Japan, um, it was around about the time that Breaks from the Border had come out. So this is maybe 2011. Uh, we played in a, a, a stage that had maybe a, a 15,000 capacity field and just as we're getting ready to go on, the field starts to fill up and it's raining quite heavily and everybody has umbrellas and or rain hats and raincoats, but they all come file into the field. The field pretty much fills up and we came on stage and we started singing um, Take What You Need, which is, which is from that album where we did the gang vocals, Breaks, Breaks from the Border. 
and the album had been out for maybe two months and a significant portion of the crowd are singing along to it and that was just a real moment of like whoa I, I, we're they know us they know our song how has this happened this is amazing and um so that's that's the one that really sticks in the mind well, and the fact that they were willing to stand in the rain so do you feel do you still have a decent following in japan uh, yeah, we just played actually uh, about a month ago. We did two shows, one in Tokyo, one in Osaka, and uh, yeah, we pulled. I think we had about six hundred people came to the uh, the Tokyo show, packed into this venue. That in the states, the capa the legal capacity for this room would be no more than three hundred, but because everyone's so tiny in Japan and they're also really well behaved, they all will just stand still with their arms by their sides. Their their fire codes allow them to have way way more people in in the same. Uh, in the same size group so um that was a really fun show the tokyo one um so we'll yeah we we tend to go back there every two or three years or so and we sometimes go back for fuji rock festival that um done that two or three times i think but it's mainly the states we cut, the next show we have is uh, in new orleans for for jazz fest and we're doing two shows at the house of blues um in, in the first weekend of may and the, the saturday night show starts at about 2 a.m. and we'll go on till about 5 or 6 a.m. We're going to travel that one, like the other one. It's, what did you say? I said, you better not have that as your travel day. Like the other No, well, I, the, the thing is, I will have arrived the day before the first one. I'm going to try and stay on British time, and then I'll just look at it as like a. it's 8 o'clock in the morning. This is breakfast. I'm getting up for my regular day like I'm at home, but I'm on stage and it's the middle of the night. And anything else uh, coming up for this year? Uh, you, you're going to do some more shows? You're going to get back in the studio maybe? Um, we, we do need to make another record. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to happen. It will happen in Denver when it does because we now have a, um, a studio and a house there that um, the guitarist has set up because he, ha he, he runs a label there now. Um, and uh, we will hopefully do some stuff in Europe um, we're hoping to do some stuff in in July. We're just waiting to hear what what the offers are because um, it. I I kind of miss playing in places like France and Italy and Spain and Germany and we did we did a lot of that in the early days, and then we've kind of lost touch with the, with the scene. So it would be nice to do that and to bring Lamar, who's who's the the only American in the band, to bring him over and show him Europe. Although this is just after Brexit happened and we'll probably have to get visas now to work there. <laughs> Damn it. Um, How can people keep in touch uh, with, with you and, and the band and, and all that good stuff? Right, so yeah, if anyone is still watching after hearing me ramble on for this long, um, you, can, uh, you can find us on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash newmastersounds. Um, but we also have a fan page called the New Master Fans. So if you if you get into it, you should join that because there are other people who share stuff, uh, information about what we're up to, and uh, photos and recordings and things from the past. And that's been we set that up about less than a year ago, and it's it's proved to be really popular. Um, we have a website, newmastersounds.com. We're on Instagram and Twitter and um, YouTube. So just look for new master sounds and um, there's 20 years worth of stuff that wade through. If you have nothing better to do. <laughs> hey, Simon, thank you so much uh, for all this great information and stories and spending the time and congratulations on, on 20 years in with the group and wish you a continued success. I pre really appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube. Go to the Funkin' Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing, and it is a beautiful thing, all coming together 
for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the funkinstuff.net website. And on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also drop me a line, email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz and uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show, The True Music Lover. So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.